Hey, what's up? This is Gary from Raz Rentals, and finally, after about four months, I'm going to review NECA's Rex 1 action figure. Since the beginning of this line, I was hoping we would get this guy, even though I both love and hate him. Yes, I love this dude in the cartoon, and I think his design is very fun and cool looking, but my hatred has nothing to do with the show or his character, or anything like that. It comes from another piece of Ninja Turtle media, and uh, I'll get into it when I discuss his history. But for the most part, you know, just know I like this guy, but at the same time, this guy frustrated me so much as a kid. <laughs> and I'll get into it, don't worry. Rex comes packaged in the standard NECA TMNT Fred Wolf deluxe figure design, you know, where the box looks just like the classic VHS tapes that we all had back in the day. Rex here is number nine. Um, I haven't gotten rid of any of my boxes because they look so damn cool, you know? They all look so awesome together. This deluxe figure is titled From the Files of Pizza Squad. And the illustration here was done by Dan Elson and Aaron Hazuri. Uh, Hazuri provided the layouts and Dan created the final art. You know, it's a perfect example of two talented um, illustrators working together. The composition layout is nice and clean. I love how nothing obstructs anything uh, and everything is framed really well, you know, perfectly. I especially like how, like, you know, Rex really stands out here and you have Donatello. And I like how this bow comes down perfectly between his body and the guys down here who are sort of framed down here and Raph is framed over there. That all looks good. You know, they fill in all the gaps and it's just an exciting design. Um, Dan's final art is nice and clean as usual. You know, he always does a really good job painting these things. I love Don's expression here. I think that's hilarious. He looks so freaked out, it's perfect. Um, while the other guys are worried, you know, he's really upset. Rex looks perfect. The highlights on him um, not only make him appear three-dimensional, but they also make him look like he's made out of metal, which is good, you know? <laughs> because he stands out against the guys who have a more organic um, shading to their, to their bodies. On the bookend, uh, you can see that the bookend appears just like the old VHS tapes. And, of course, you have volume 9 down at the bottom. That's all good. You know, I do think that the purple on the bookend goes so nice with the cover. Yeah. Well, that works really well together, the color of everything. On the back, there's some nice action shots. It's cool how you can see the inside of Rex's body here. And then down at the bottom, I love how Donatello is smiling at Rex. You know, I guess he helped bring him back to life. In Donatello's hand, he has the uh, Eye of Sarnoth fragment tracker that appears in the Season 2 episode, The Mean Machines. Now, that was actually included in the accessory set, and uh, I'm currently trying to write a review for that, so I will cover that as much as I can. It also appears uh, later on down the line, too, in the show. But uh, you would think that they would have put the controller in his hand, so that's kind of weird. Up at the top left, you have a nice description for Rex here. It says, Crime wave clamps down on New York City, and Channel 6's star reporter, April O'Neil, is the latest victim. After a couple of crummy crooks burgle her apartment, April receives a tip-top tip, leading her to a big scoop. The understaffed police department has developed a robot enforcement experiment, a.k.a. Rex One, programmed to serve and protect you. Meanwhile, in his wicked warehouse, the Sinister Shredder has stumbled upon a terrifying techno trick. Stolen blueprints to mass produce a criminal constabulary to crush the turtles, control the city, and conquer the world. To fight Shredhead's felonious fuzz, Rex requires the ultimate robo reboot VHS tapes. Powered by pop culture and pizza, Rex One delivers the final blow, shutting down Shredder's automatronic aspirations. Crime does not compute for Rex One. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, the final thing that I have to talk about here, obviously, is this giant illustration. You know, that takes up most of the back here. Um, that was done by Dan Elson all by himself, uh, from what I've heard. And, um, you know, again... 
it looks great. You know, the, the paint quality looks fine and perfect here. Um, now, you probably know who Rex 1 is, but who's that guy? Well, that's the mean green giant. He showed up in the season 6 episode, Polly Won a Pizza. In that episode, Mikey adopts a pet parrot whose real owner is the notorious gangster Muggsy McGuffin. You see, there was a mix-up at Ralph's Rent-A-Pet, and he was only supposed to be there for a cleanup, but Ralph sold him to Michelangelo instead of a different parrot because apparently parrots all look the same to him. When Muggsy arrives home from prison, he finds a bird that is not his Polly, and he gets pretty upset about it because his Polly wears a key around his neck that unlocks a vault where he stashed the Galuby Ruby. So Muggsy and his lackey Boris go search for the real deal. They head to Ralph's Rent-A-Pet, uh, and he tells him that he sold the bird to a weird guy with a green face. So Muggsy and Boris search the city until they find a guy walking down an alley with a green face. They go hassle the large green gentleman and call him a goon, and, well, the goon does not take it well, because turns out he's the mean green giant, the undefeated champion of the World Wrestling League. The mean green giant gives the two troublemakers a lesson in manners, and that's all we see of him. He disappears from the episode. Why is he attacking Rex on the back here? I don't know. But I love the reference here. I think it's cool that they included such an obscure character from the show. You move back to the front and you look down the bottom. It lists director Randy Falk, Trevor Zammett, Sculpt and Fabrication, Brody Perkins, Paint, Jeff Trapp, Mike Puzo, Prototypes, Roger Fernandez, Photography, Stephen Mazurik, Packaging, Travis Hasback, Illustrations, Daniel Elson, and her Aaron Hazuri. Down at the bottom says Nickelodeon, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, NECA, Real Toys, all that stuff. Ooh, look at that. Accessories include blasters, oil can, remote control, tongue, VHS tapes, and interchangeable hands. Cool. I like it when they include the uh, accessory list down at the bottom. So, let's open this dude up real quick and get a look at the inside here. Um, now, this looks pretty awesome, I gotta say, you know. I like this big shot right here of Rex. Right here in this laboratory, you can see Donatello's portable portal generator. He looks good in there too. <laughs> yeah, he looks really cool. I think maybe his upper torso is might be a little big, but I have to look at the cartoon and compare him a little bit. I feel like his proportion should be more like the cover here, but you know, it's fine. I still think he looks really neat. The window over here is nice and big so you can see his full body, plus pretty much all of his accessories. And they don't look as though they are obscured. You know, behind him you have the hands, but really, does anybody like, oh man, look at that left hand. That's the coolest left hand I ever saw. No, you want to see all the goodies inside. So now, I'm going to open this guy up. I'm going to move him around, and I will get back to you in a second. So here he is, free from his prison of cardboard and plastic, and ready to serve and protect you and you alone. That's right. Once this marvelous machine finds his one and only true controller, he'll serve and protect her for the rest of his life. Ah yes, I remember dating. At first glance, this dude is big and bulky like you'd want him to be, but I do think there are some proportions that could be filled out a little more, you know, namely the legs. But I'll get to it once I get to cartoon accuracy. First, let's discuss his cartoon history. Rex One only appeared in two episodes of the classic Team and T series, but I only remember seeing the first one as a kid. Despite this, Rex never left my memory. You know, every time I would think of the classic series, he was a guy that would pop in my mind. He's definitely a parody of Robocop. He's got the cuirass or the breastplate or whatever, you know, with the overemphasized pecs, just like Robocop, the segmented abdomen, just like Robocop. Uh, it even kind of looks like he has those, like, glasses he wears. Could be sort of like a visor, just like Robocop, you know? Um, you might think this is crazy, but I also see Rex as an Arnold Schwarzenegger spoof. There's something about his pecs and his traps and his overall massive size, like something about his build that really reminds me of Arnold back in the day. Even his back, I feel like there's some kind of similarity there, you know? When you see the evil Rex ones frowning, all I see is the Terminator. 
Rex One first appeared in the Season 2 episode, New York's Shiniest. As this episode begins, the Shredder shares some interesting information with Krang about his brand new evil scheme to destroy the Turtles. The Shredder says the city's police are understaffed, so they're building a brand new robotic police force. Shredder plans to steal one of those robots, reprogram it, and make clones of it. The perfect plan, right? Well, Krang doesn't seem to be too enthusiastic about it. I like how he's like, geez, again with the turtles? All right, but if you fail, that's it. I'm not going to respect you anymore, and I don't think anybody else will. You'll be stuck working with those two moronic mutants for the rest of your life. He didn't say it exactly like that, but that's how I heard it, okay? Meanwhile, across town, April and Irma enter April's apartment, only to find it being robbed. Man, these dudes got a lot of guts, because April's best buzz with the turtles, right? I think these dudes have a cool look. You know, I think that they would make uh, cool extra gang members for your Ninja Turtles to pound on, on your shelf. NECA, if you're listening, maybe you should make these guys, you know? Cool? They have no... I don't think they have any name or anything like that, but, you know, I'd get them. After these robbers leave, April calls the guys to come and help her. Now, there's a cool scene here where Mikey throws up his nunchucks to unscrew a light bulb, and instead of pulling out the bulb by itself, he pulls down the entire ceiling light. And he actually does it again once the guys confront April's burglars. Here, he manages to unscrew the light like he tried to in the previous scene. You would think that maybe this ability would come in handy later on in the episode, like, you know, maybe he would use this to somehow stop the evil Rex 1 robots, but no. It all built up to this scene one minute later. This confrontation isn't much of a battle scene either. Like, no one really fights. The turtles just lift up a van to show how strong they are, and the bad guys run away. The villains should have been like, man, these morons are leaving their bodies completely unprotected. Let's go tickle them or push them under the van so it falls on top of them and crushes them. They had a pretty good opening, and they just didn't take it. The guys return April's things, which are already ruined, but... April doesn't stay long, you know? She doesn't even seem to be too upset about it. April's only got one thing on her mind, her newest scoop. You see, while April was complaining about being robbed, Irma gave her the great idea to write a story about it. So April talked to one of her police informants, and he told her to go check out a secret police laboratory or warehouse to investigate the existence of a top secret experimental robot cop. Jeez, April knows the Shredder knows, doesn't sound so secret, now does it? Here at this warehouse, April discovers the Robot Enforcement Experiment, or Rex-1 for short. Rex says that he's here to serve and protect only her. Rex's personality is somewhat silly, I guess. You know, he's already cracking jokes the minute she wakes him up, and he takes things way too literal when she tells him to hold his tongue so she can hide from two security guards who are looking for her. Unfortunately, April gets pinched by the fuzz, but Rex isn't having it. He tosses these guys for disturbing the peace, resisting arrest, and using bad grammar. April takes off, but Rex follows her like a lovesick puppy. I love how instead of going down the steps, he just leaps right out the window. Um, you know, I'm calling citizens arrest, Rex. You just left a crater in the sidewalk and destroyed some private property. You can't get away with that. Rex says that April is his controller, and again, he says that he will only serve and protect her. I find it funny how Rex keeps calling her sir. You would think that maybe she would have, like, yelled at him about it at some point, but no, she doesn't, you know? She just kind of takes it as he carries her home. Back at April's apartment, Rex makes April some tasty treats because he says that he's been programmed to cook as well as he can fight. Their special alone time doesn't last very long, though, because Irma enters, and immediately she throws herself at him because even though he's made out of metal, he's still a dude, and Irma cannot stop herself. The security guards show up, but don't worry, Rex gets them to leave. He's very persuasive. Next, April takes Rex to meet the turtles, and he rudely introduces himself by breaking one of Don's bows. Man, that spinning bow there looks just like that NECA spinning bow that they just revealed at San Diego Comic-Con this year. April tells the guys that Rex followed her home, and now the police think that she stole him. How will she clear her name? She doesn't know, and she doesn't care. All she cares about is her latest scoop, which is to reveal to the world highly classified top secret police business. 
How's she going to do that from the sewers? Well, by breaking more laws. She sends the guys to go kidnap Vernon up in the Channel 6 news building and also to steal some equipment and a Channel 6 news camera. Broadcasting from the sewers, she says that the police plan to make more and replace the human police officers. Could you imagine being a police officer in New York City and seeing this broadcast? Robots? What the hell am I going to do for work now? How many of those officers had to resort to a life of crime to support their families? Where the hell was the union on this one? All while this is happening, the Shredder manages to tap into the city's computers, and now he has access to the Rex-1 prototype plans. He uses these plans to create an army of evil Rex-1s. I love how he tells them that phase one of his plan is to destroy the turtles, and then he shows them all a picture of the guys and, you know, sends them on their way. Like, this picture in my opinion, is just hilarious. Where the hell did he get this picture? Why were they all standing side by side in the same exact pose with the same exact expression on their faces? Do they hand it out to all of their enemies for promotional purposes? Where did this photo come from? So the evil robots attack the turtles on a bridge, and even though the guys are in the turtle van, they decide that they can't drive through them. So they back up into even more robots. Now they're completely surrounded. And the only place to go is through a hole in the bridge that the uh, evil robots had blasted. And that's exactly where they go. They drive that van right into the river. What a waste. Now the van's gone and completely destroyed. You know, why couldn't they back it into the Rex clones at full speed? All they probably would have done is dent the bumper a little bit. Now it's completely sunk in the river. Not only that, but there's blasters on top of the thing, like they'd even try to shoot the robots. The Rex-1 clones report to the Shredder that the turtles are gone, so the Shredder decides to move on to Phase 2, rob the city. I forgot to mention earlier that the Channel 6 building here is pretty cool looking, and for whatever reason, I guess I missed it whenever I made my Channel 6 box set review, but I like that, I like the green color, that's neat. Because of their attack, Channel 6 goes off the air, so Splinter, April, and Rex decide to go investigate what is happening out there. They take the turtle van and... Wait a minute. They take the turtle van? Like, just a minute ago, the guys drove the van into the river, and then they surfaced without the vehicle, just floating all by themselves. Where the hell did this extra van come from? Are there two of them? I'm surprised uh, NECA isn't jumping in on this, you know. Buy two of them, everybody. There's two turtle vans. This is one of the best parts in the entire episode. April, Splinter, and Rex get surrounded by the evil Rex clones. So Rex exits the van to serve and protect April. There's a cool shootout scene. Rex destroys one of them, but then he gets uh, blasted. And then one of the clones shoots a gargoyle that uh, falls from the sky and crushes Rex. Bummer, dude. The guys show up to finish off the other evil Rex clones, and Donnie volunteers to take Rex back home to the sewers so he can fix them up. With some wire, a transistor tube from their television, and three videotapes, he's able to fix Rex up and reprogram him. As usual, Don's work has a, a little hiccup, but... uh. Don says that he uh, successfully reprogrammed Rex to be able to control the other Rex clones. The guys set up a trap at a local amusement park. There's uh, some nice shots here, including the army of evil Rexes moving in on the turtles, the turtle fireworks, and uh, the evil Rex army shooting at the turtles on a merry-go-round. I like all of that, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a cool end scene. Rex goes uh, through a few personality shifts because of the tapes inside of his body. He turns into a cowboy, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, Curly from The Three Stooges, but finally he's able to control the evil robots when he becomes an aerobics instructor. You only see two of them get blown up, but I guess, you know, that's good enough. I know Splinter is uh, super excited about it. So that's it, you know, the episode ends... And Irma reveals to April that her and Rex 1 are going out on a date. Rex says that uh, he's here to serve and protect April and take Irma to the movies. Man, this dude gets around. I like this one. I feel like all the season two episodes are just classic episodes that are a fun watch. I think maybe in my head I built 
Rex's role to be like much bigger than it is. Like I remember as a kid, um, really feeling the weight of the shootout and Rex's destruction and his eventual revival, you know, like it just seemed huge and dramatic, but it's all pretty light in all honesty. I mean, I was like five at the time, so don't judge me too much. Up next is the season five episode, Leonardo Renaissance Turtle. This episode is an interesting one because the turtles split up and do their own thing for a little bit. Uh, you get a, a nice uh, punk frog cameo when Raph and Mikey go to Florida. You also get to see the cheapskate, which I always like. As this episode begins, April reports on the news that the mayor has plans to get rid of all the city's crime. Again, the city is going through a massive crime wave. Like every single episode, come on. Just to cement how bad things really are, Donatello says he just got jumped coming home from the library. And who will want to steal an amoeba book, right? So the turtles go to the mayor's news conference, and the mayor introduces Professor Ignatz Mindbender. And then Mindbender introduces everybody to uh, his new invention, the Law Enforcement Expeter, or Lex. Now, when I first saw this episode years ago, I was thinking, what the hell? This is like the same thing as Rex. Like, are they even going to mention him in this episode that this is like the same idea? Short answer, yes. <laughs> but just be patient. You know, you'll see what's up. Lex begins to clean up the city's scum, and he does a good job of it, you know? Too good, in fact. He puts the turtles out of business. So Mikey and Raph head to Florida, Donnie goes to work on the turtle transmitter, and Leonardo stays in the city because he's a little suspicious of Lex. As you're about to see, Leonardo had every right to be uh, suspicious of Lex because Lex starts to go haywire. He starts to arrest people for little things. He even tries to arrest Leonardo and uh, April for walking during a don't walk symbol. Like, I do that shit all the time. <laughs> Ooh, I shouldn't admit that on here. Just as he's about to take Leonardo and April downtown for uh, booking, uh, he gets distracted by a uh, professor mindbender and Leonardo and April head to the sewer to escape. I like how when they decide to watch the news, Vernon reveals that April was fired from her job because of her uh, recent crime wave, right? Uh, panicked, Leo tries to call the guys, but, you know, he has no luck. He's not really able to uh, talk to them to tell them anything. Boy, it really seems like Leonardo and April are heading towards the slammer. That is until Leonardo Dick Van Dykes his way into a great plan. Let's go get Rex one! The duo arrive at the police department warehouse where April breaks into the building. Jeez Louise, she really is shady. They find the room with Rex and unveil him just like they did in the first episode. Here you can see a, a good shot of one of Rex's control panels as Leonardo turns him on. Unfortunately, Rex's wires are like a little crossed or something and um, he doesn't know who he is. So he tells Leonardo to hit his memory button and, you know, Leonardo's got like the Peter Parker luck or something like that, because instead of hitting the memory button, he accidentally hits like the erase memory button. So now in order to get Rex to uh, remember who April and Leonardo are, uh, they make him watch some of April's old news reports. Rex asks them for a six pack of hydraulic fluid while he watches, but uh, Leonardo tells him he's not allowed to drink on the job. So finally, Rex remembers who he is and who they are, but it's too late. Lex is in the sewers. That's right. He found April and Leo in the sewer lair. How the hell did he do that? I don't know. I guess he's got like the detective skills or something like that. So Rex lets Lex know that he's there to serve and protect April and the turtles. And the two mighty metallic marshals go at it for about two seconds until uh, Lex calls Rex primitive, and then he zaps him with some kind of beam that reprograms him. Now Rex and Lex attack Leonardo and April. Rex slips, and Leo and April escape on one of Mikey's cheapskates. Back at City Hall, Professor Mindbender reveals his plan to arrest everybody in the city. Leonardo and April show up not to stop him because they don't know what's going on, but because they want... Uh, Mindbender to reprogram Lex and Rex. Unfortunately, before they can get to Mindbender, Rex, like, tries to arrest them. In order to get Rex to uh, remember them again, 
April asks if he remembers the feelings they had for each other. Like, yeah, lady, I remember you pushing me off on your friend Irma. Thanks a lot. The only way Leo is able to jog Rex's memory is by giving him a swift kick in the butt. Finally, Rex is back to normal, but unfortunately, Rex is no match for Lex. So Leonardo has to resort to other tactics. He tricks Lex into turning on Mindbender, which uh, makes Mindbender turn Lex off. And that's the end of Lex. By using the skills of his three brothers, Leo was able to save the day. He truly is the Renaissance turtle. So by this time in the show, the other guys show up and everyone heads to the sewers for some pizza. Rex drinks some oil or uh, Raph calls it antifreeze. Rex asks April uh, what will become of him now. April responds that she's sure the police force would love to have him back. What, like before when he was lying dormant for a year or two or something like that and they completely forgot about him and made another robot? I don't know if I'd listen to her ever, you know. The episode ends with Donatello introducing Rex to a robot he made named Rex Ann. And her job is to serve and protect Rex. So this episode is another fun one. I like it a lot. It would be cool if NECA decided to put a Lex in the future. You know, we'll see. Some of this episode retreads on the original one, but, you know, I like the mostly solo Leonardo adventure. It makes it a little different than your, you know, run-of-the-mill Ninja Turtle episode. Rex is, like, designed a little different in this one, or at least just, like, the model changed. His, like, proportions are different than in the first one. And, uh, you know, we'll get into that in a minute. But first, I'm going to let you know why I kind of hate this dude, you know, as I said in the beginning of this video. These two episodes are great. I like Lex, but I'm going to tell you why I kind of hate Rex's guts. This damn game right here is why I kind of hate this dude, all right? I love this game. I think it's a lot of fun. Almost, I, I don't know. I don't know if I like this one or the first one better. I think both of them are pretty good. You know, I liked playing them as a kid, but the battle with Rex in this game just pissed me off as a kid. <laughs> I never understood, you know, why my time kept going down so quickly and like I could never ever save any of my turtles. This battle haunted me as a child and came to me in my nightmares, you know. It wasn't until I got older that I realized that my time was significantly decreasing every time I got hit by uh, Rex. Uh, but now I know and now Rex can suck it. Now let's talk about cartoon accuracy. Rex here is a mix of how he appears in both of his episodes. Some details cross over and some are very episode specific. Um, in general, I would say that in the cartoon, like his whole lower half is like longer and more filled out. You know, his pelvis is longer. His abdomen is a little bigger. He kind of has a more natural build here the legs and the abdomen appear very thin or something like that like he's he's a little skinnier than how he should appear because then you got this giant um upper torso which would be fine but like i said the bottom of it all needs to balance out a little better i think in the first episode he seems to have broader shoulders and if you look at his back the segments appear more like muscles here with this action figure, you know, the shoulders are a little closer together, which I'll actually show you looks more like the second appearance of uh, of Rex. But the back here, I don't know, it looks a little more uniform, a little just kind of rounded, you know. It's not really bulging or anything like it does in the, the that first episode to make it look like muscle mass. As I said, in the second appearance, um, they kind of made him a little smaller in size. You know, he's not as massive looking and you know the uh the shoulders are a little closer together also his uh upper torso is uh a little rounded out i think a little more like this action figure in new york's shiniest he talks by moving this like bit around a little bit this uh like lower jaw piece i kind of feel like it like the mouth is a little too high up here because you would possibly want to move this around a little bit to make it look like he's talking um in that episode the only time you see the mouth there is whenever he uh holds on to his tongue i lied you also see his mouth whenever he blows the smoke from his blaster 
in the second episode, that jaw moves around a lot, but there's actually like a big mouth there. Like there's a big black opening that just is not present in the first episode. So obviously this face here is, uh, you know, more similar to that first appearance of uh, Rex. But like I said, I just feel like you should have more um, movement with this jaw before seeing that mouth. It's just my opinion. The arm is the same in both episodes. You have the same robotic details and the same robotic boxy muscle definition, right? The biceps all look very square and so does the forearm. Here on the action figure, you can see that all of that is present, you know, exactly how it appeared in the cartoon. You got the piston here that connects like the shoulder joint to this uh, elbow wheel. Um, down here, the they got kind of lucky because um, like this joint right here almost looks like there's a cut in there for wrist articulation. And that's exactly how it looks in the cartoon. It looks like there is like built-in robotic articulation there. The only thing I would say is on this toy here is that maybe this piece right here should be a little more rounded. You know, here it's it's like pretty square looking. The hands look like policeman gloves. And uh, in the cartoon, the fingers are like double lines between the different segments, you know, like on the knuckle, there's two lines. Um, and the, the back of the glove looks like the, the back of the glove in Leonardo Renaissance Turtle, but is different from how it appears in um, uh, New York's Shiniest. Rex's upper torso and pecs, I mean, look pretty much the same from episode to episode. There's a few changes that I'll get into, but I mean, pretty much you got these big um, pecs right here, and you have the Rex One name tag on this side and the badge on the other side. You know, that's exactly how it is in the cartoon. These buttons down here underneath the pec, um, those buttons only appear after Donatello repairs Rex in the sewer layer. Um, this button right here turns Rex on. Other than that, it doesn't show up in the rest of the episode, it doesn't show up in the second episode. Unfortunately, I didn't notice any good shots inside of Rex's peck here uh, during New York's shiniest. And the hinge in that episode is actually in the middle of this chest. So it kind of opens up this way. Here, this action figure, the hinge is on top and you open it up and you can see all those cool little buttons and gizmos or whatever in there. Um, that actually comes from the second episode, Leonardo Renaissance Turtle. In that episode, the hinge is on the top, just like this toy. It all matches this pretty much perfectly. You know, there might be a little, like, details in there that's not really drawn on here, but it's, it's fine. And in order for Leonardo to turn, uh, Rex on during that episode, he actually pushes, pushes this big, uh, purple button. Um, the colors of all these look, look good, you know? They seem to match what you see in the cartoon just fine. My only problem with this is um, there's like a little bit of warping right here. This is like a soft piece of vinyl and there's some warping on the top and there also seems to be a hole behind it. So you could probably um, easily pull this thing out of there and just look at this giant hole. Um, the other side uh, in the cartoon, the hinge is shown on the side closer to like where his shoulder is, you know, where his bicep. Um, here, again, the hinge is on top. And you open that up and you can see some pretty nice details in there. There's some really cool things that I really like. Like, I love this little design right here, whatever this thing is supposed to be. And you got like a little wire coming off of it going down. This again is shown in Leonardo Renaissance Turtle. That big red button right there is supposed to be his memory button. That's all present here on this toy. The only thing that's really missing is um, up here in this gray bar, it should say memory, but they did not write it. Again, my like circuitry board or whatever this is supposed to be inside of here is warped at the top and you can, e you can feel even more of a hole on this side behind that thing. In New York Shiniest, his abdomen is navy blue, just like his pants. And in Leonardo Renaissance Turtle, his abdomen matches his shirt. It's like that baby blue um, police shirt color, which I think probably makes more sense. I don't know which I prefer. I think both of them look fine. I think it kind of looks cool in the first episode how it is. But to be honest with you, 
you're not getting that much articulation out of this joint anyway. So, but like even the pelvis, I feel like it should be a little bigger, a little more filled out. It just, everything feels very thin. You have the same like belt design here where you got, I guess this white, these white things going across here. And then you have this black belt. Um, you got these uh, cool gray, I don't know, crunch joints or something like that like i would imagine as he's like moving his leg up it go like like sort of like that or are these supposed to be straps for his holsters i couldn't tell because if you were a cop you wouldn't wear your holster straps all the way up here that'd be uncomfortable as hell but so i think that they are they connected to the whole I, I always assumed that the holsters were connected up to like the belt and this was a separate piece inside of his uh pelvis right here the uh, shin guards down here, you know, I don't think, I couldn't really find, like, this design perfectly in the cartoon, you know. Lots of times it's a little wider. It's just very big and um, wide down here. And it's just kind of different than how it appears in the show. Um, they look fine. I just, to me, I think maybe the way that they're shaped, they just don't appear like they're actually like a, a metal shield or something like that for his shins, but whatever. Still looks good. Now, the shoe design down here, um, that is actually the same in both episodes. The only uh, difference is down here on the bottom, the treads of the shoes, these match how they appear in Leonardo Renaissance Turtle, um, which is pretty different than how it appears in uh, New York's Shiniest. On the back here too, I do want to mention that the segments all look good and you know, they're perfect for how they appear in the episodes. And uh, I don't know, the back of the pants here are black to sort of give it that like cell shaded look with the navy blue in the front. And it looks very nice. His blasters match New York's Shiniest the most. In that episode, he actually gets to use them, so you see them at different angles. In Leonardo Renaissance Turtle, I don't know, they kind of shrink them a little bit, and they really kind of, you know, don't focus on them much. He never uses them. Uh, the color's a little different, too, because they made the scopes or the crosshairs a lighter gray. Here you can see on this action figure that they fit on the holsters just fine, you know. There's a little peg on the side of them that you can stick into the side of the holster. And getting it to, uh, putting it like into his hand is actually really easy. I mean, you see how easy that fit in there? That was perfect. So, I think they're a really cool looking design. And look at that, his finger is actually sitting on top of the trigger, which is nice. I always liked how the handle kind of um, wraps around the back of the hand like that. That's very cool. It's got a pretty cool looking uh, uh, barrel here with like these two points coming down the side of it. And then you have these uh, like futuristic crosshairs. But yeah, you can see him shoot this thing a lot in that first episode, New York's Shiniest. When it comes to scale, there's only a few people you can really compare him to. I mean, very rarely does he actually stand next to the Ninja Turtles. He doesn't stand next to Shredder, Bebop, and Rocksteady, or anybody like that. You mostly see him next to, like, Donatello, or Irma, or April. In the cartoon, he says that he's seven feet tall. And in this one shot, he's, like, ridiculously huge, right? But, um, you know, that obviously was a mistake, because here he looks normal, like, like how he should appear and that's like you know the very next shot most of the times in the cartoon it appears as though april's head is either in the middle of his pecs or the top of his pecs irma's head usually lands around the bottom of his pecs same thing with the ninja turtles all right here you can see this action figure is way bigger than that <laughs> It'll be interesting to see what April looks like next to him once I eventually get that brand new April with the longer neck. For the most part, Rex 1 features the standard NECA articulation. The only point that seems missing, or maybe I just can't get it to move, is the waist right here. You know, I think most of their action figures have a waist swivel, but man, he's got nothing, or that's just locks into place, you know. Can you get this to move? Let me know. The, uh, the movement on him is pretty decent, but his angular robotic design 
gets in the way a lot. You know, I, I don't think that's a sculptor thing. That's just a um, a cartoon accuracy thing, you know, especially these uh, super boxy biceps and whatnot. So from the top down, the mouth articulates, which is good. The uh, head has a ball joint, so you can move it from side to side. Unfortunately, the hair is so long in the back that you can't really get him to look up. I mean, most of the times you're going to get him, have him looking down at the Ninja Turtles because he's so much taller than everybody. His uh, shoulder swivels around, and you have a hinge. You can get about that far up, um, which is good if you want to get him into some aerobic kick poses or whatever. The, uh, the bicep swivel... It's very difficult because of, like I said, you have these very sharp edges, these big pointy edges, I guess. And um, yeah, sometimes that just stops. It'll just hit the body. And um, I don't know. I just found it a little limiting, especially when I showed you before. I guess I haven't showed it yet. But um, if you're like trying to put something up to his mouth, like have him grab his tongue or um, hold the oil can to his mouth, you know, that is going to block that from happening. Um, he's got single jointed elbows, which are nice. You know, there's a, a nice click in there to hold it into place. Down at the wrist, you have a swivel and you also have a hinge. Most of the hinges are um, horizontal hinges, but his uh, trigger fingers have vertical hinges, which is pretty good. Now this joint right here, this um, upper torso artic <laughs> upper torso joint, um, like, I don't know. I feel like it's almost unusable. Like. You can't really turn him much to the side. He doesn't have much of a looking up or looking down with that. I don't know. It's, I guess it offers some movement, but like it's very, very limited. Um, it doesn't really work out that well. Down here, the, uh, the hips, you have the standard NECA hips, which are good. I like these hips because um, I feel like you know, you never feel like you're going to break your toy with them. And I feel like you get a, a nice bit of movement. They uh, rotate around. Plus, you have like the like a, a piece wrapped around the ball, which gets you to um, lift the leg out pretty good or lift it forward. Pretty nice. You know, it's all good. But again, um, like because of the way he's built or um, designed, like he is a little stiff. Like you'll be trying to get him into some poses, but... Um, I don't know. It's just it it's it's not the easiest to try to balance him without just kind of leaving him with his legs like completely straight down. You have single jointed knees which work well. I like how the um down here it kind of flaps. It kind of looks like it kind of runs into the bottom piece. That way it's not like um a little jarring or you don't have these weird like cuts and stuff in there. It's it's pretty good, you know. And then down at the ankles you have um a hinge and you have ankle rockers like I said it's it can be a little difficult trying to balance him but in general he is pretty good the brand new radical Rex one is a wonderful reimagining of the animated robot in action figure form the sculptor did a great job mixing details from both Rex one episodes which makes him the ultimate fan pleaser I really like that you can open up his pecs to see like the control panels and buttons underneath that's all wonderful my only complaint is, uh, I think they should have given him a fuller, thicker, lower half. You know, he looks like he skipped leg day because he's got these gigantic feet and really thin legs and his, his abdomen is just too small. Like if they would have filled that out a little bit, he would have been perfect. I really think widening the hips would have uh, done a lot to make him look less stiff. The paint on mine is pretty good, but I do have some globs here and there, especially like on top of the Rex 1 name tag. The articulation on this guy is pretty good. You know, as I said, the like the hard angles of the biceps get in the way. I was thinking like, well, could they have like cut that down a little bit and made the biceps smaller? But then it's like, no, you don't want the biceps to be smaller. You want this guy to be like a big hulking machine. I think the only thing that I would have done differently or, you know, as I said before, I don't know if it's just my uh, problem here is I would have given him a waist cut. You know, I think all action figures need waist cuts. That's the only way that you can really create dynamic poses that make the action figures look animated, you know, because as you move, your pelvis moves one way and your shoulders usually move the opposite direction. You know, it's just, it gives the characters more life. Now, accessories. And first up you have 
Rex 1's blasters. Um, I talked about these earlier during the cartoon accuracy section, but you know, just for the sake of it, uh, you can fit both of these on his holsters. Um, you can also fit both of them very easily in his uh, trigger finger hands, which you just kind of like push in here and rotate it around and the hand will find the trigger there. Of course, this one didn't go in all the way. My fingers are getting crushed here a little bit, but with the other hand, I was getting that pretty easily. But it looks good. You know, it's a very cool design, as I said before. You know, I like the barrel, the these, uh, like, wings on the top of it, the sights. It's very, very cool. Um, in the cartoon, he uses the blaster only in uh, New York's shiniest. I don't think he ever uses both of them at the same time. It's always just the one. And um, he uses them to uh, shoot at doors and also a few evil Rex clones. And that's it. Next, you have Rex One's controller. He hands this uh, to April and says that she's supposed to use this to control him. She never really does though. And eventually, after he gets uh, crushed by the gargoyle and Donatello reprograms him, Donatello uses this controller to control Rex to control the Rex clones. Kind of weird. He uses that dial there to um, turn between the different personalities within Rex, you know, because of those three VHS tapes going from the cowboy to Dorothy to Curly to aerobics instructor the colors on this thing and the overall design looks perfect to how it appears in the show you know all the colors match and all that stuff it's all good the only thing i would say is you know in the little screen here it should say rex one it doesn't but it's perfectly fine it's still a very cool very unique looking uh controller design even uh on the back here there's like these two little uh vents here or whatever they're supposed to be these little indents um they appear in one shot in the episode so that's pretty cool that they you know caught that little detail there and decided to put it on here so you can get rex to hold this thing with his trigger fingers just fine and because he has that trigger finger it kind of wraps around this uh part where it sticks out a little bit you know it actually fits in there pretty good getting april to hold this thing though however is a uh, another story all together because she has such a small tiny grip that uh this thing is just a little too big for her hand and it's just going to stretch that hand out and make it hard for you to hold the things that she would usually hold like a a microphone or whatever or even the camera now getting donatello to hold it that uh can also be done perfectly fine him holding it with his regular gripping hand so Good job, Donatello. High five. They included Rex's tongue, which is just funny, and it can easily be inserted into his mouth right here. Like so. It's giving uh, Gene Simmons a run for his money. Now, if you want him to hold his tongue like he does in the cartoon, you are not going to be able to do that. He is not going to be able to reach over and grab that. Even my, uh, my hinge here is... Oh, he's got a... Uh, he has a, uh, a vertical hinge, not a horizontal hinge. So, yeah, you will, you will not be able to get him to uh, grab onto his tongue and hold it. But it still looks kind of funny. I guess he's just supposed to stick it out at people. Na 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 na. Next, Rex comes with three VHS tapes. Um, these tapes contain his uh, new personality that Dontel reprograms into him. Uh, I guess on these tapes you have... Um, a cowboy movie, The Wizard of Oz, an old episode or short of The Three Stooges, and then uh, some aerobics program that Donatello uses for exercise. You know, these are funny. They don't have any labels on them. You know, this is the point where you have to get a Sharpie and then you write in that little um, clear piece of plastic like what's on the tape. Unless you're uh, rich and you can afford masking tape and then you, you know, you put a little piece of tape on the... Uh, the center here or uh, on the spine but these are cool looking tapes you know they're the same tapes I think that NECA has included with in the past 
they're just nicely done, you know, nicely done VHS tapes that you could pretty much use uh, with any toy line you might want them for. And last, you have a can of oil. Uh, Rex drinks this at the end of Leonardo Renaissance Turtle. Um, Raph actually says that it's antifreeze. And, you know, Rex, you better be careful because you better make sure that you're not mixing oil and antifreeze. You're going to have some indigestion. Now, because of his limited um, arm articulation, you're not going to be able to put this oil can all the way up to his mouth. But, I don't know, he still looks pretty cool holding it. Like, he just, you know, took a sip and he's like... Ah, now that's some tasty oil. Rex comes with nine different hands. They included a set of fists, so you can punch the bad guys in the face. A set of trigger fingers, which uh, I've showed, you know, hold these blasters perfectly. Even uh, his uh, pointer finger rests right on the trigger there, which is perfect. Um, he has a set of... Um, I don't know, these are more like reaching hands. They're not like like open grabbing hands because you can't really grab anything with them, but you can still have him like reach at people or use them for expressive purposes. You also have a set of, um, I wouldn't say that they're like karate chop hands. They're more like salute hands, but then don't you just salute with the one hand? And if you want him to salute with this hand, you can get close. But, I don't know, you can't put it, like, on his, I don't know, you, you can't get close enough to get a, uh, <laughs> to really put a, uh, a salute pose on him, unfortunately. Um, and then there is one more hand that is a special hand. Now, this hand right here has a, a nut on it. So, this hand is holding a nut, like I said. And uh, no, Rex did not ask April to marry him, although that would have been pretty funny if he would have pulled this out and asked her. No. Um, in Leonardo Renaissance Turtle, when Leonardo was trying to jog Rex's memory, he says, This is April. You were nuts about her, remember? Then Rex replies, Nuts? I remember nuts. And he pulls a nut off of his shoulder, which uh, removes his arm. All right, so that's a pretty funny gag, you know. Um, this action figure, you cannot remove the arm, unfortunately. And, you know, if you want to get uh, technical about things, um, it should actually be the left hand holding the nut. But, you know, that's for nerds like me to complain about. <laughs> Still, very funny reference. It's nice that they included this special hand. Here's Rex 1 next to a few Fred Wolf action figures. You know, as this, uh, as NECA continues to release more and more figures in this line it just gets more and more difficult to um you know put them all in a group shot you know it's just impossible but i did want to include most of the uh tall deluxe figures so that you can see that he's roughly around the same size as krang but chrome dome is still the tallest out of all of these action figures just for fun, here's Rex 1 next to, I believe, all of the robotic action figures released in this Fred Wolf series. If I'm missing one, don't kill me. But <laughs> I think I got them all. Um, you know, all these guys are pretty cool looking. I like them. Look super robotic and interesting. Here he is next to a few Super 7 Ultimate action figures, just in case you want to put him next to them. Um, you know, because he is so angular and so boxy, he kind of doesn't fit in with the Ultimates action figures because even like a character like Metalhead, you know, he's angular and boxy and robotic looking, but it's just a different style. You know, he's there's just much more detail on his body. Although I will say that uh, April's scale here is probably closer to the actual scale in the cartoon. Here he is next to some of the awesome original Playmates action figures. Man, Chrome Dome. Now who's the tallest? In your face! Also, man, you can never stand for shit, I tell you. Here he is next to some of Playmates' newer action figures. Um, I'm curious if they're going to um, uh, continue with this line or make new action figures for it. All I've seen on the shelves is them like reissuing the Shredder and the Triceraton and the Movie Turtles again and again. 
So it'll be interesting to see uh, what's up. Will we get that Krang that they revealed way back when? Who knows? And that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. You know, I hope you enjoyed. I actually enjoyed myself quite a bit because I like Rex. I think he's a cool character with a very funny personality. Like, I remember laughing when I used to watch him as a kid. Thankfully, this brand new NECA action figure, you know, didn't let me down. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, finish up more reviews as quickly as possible. I'm kind of scatterbrained at the moment. You know, there's just way too many reviews to cover. I've been kind of doing bits and pieces of a few of them and just kind of moving slowly. So hopefully things will pick up a little bit and uh, I will have something new for you soon. I'm trying to work on the accessory set, which I just got, and I'll explain that during that review. But uh, uh, I got to go because... <laughs> I can't, I can't waste any more time. I got to go work on the next one already. So thanks for watching. Let me know what you think and have a good one.